Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sparks Talks webinar series by Girls Action Foundation. I am Elvira Trudia, Communications Coordinator and Web Producer for, Go for Girls Action. And in a couple of minutes, I will be introducing today's presenter, Far uh, Farah Mawani, who will give us her tips on how to engage the public on social issues using social media and other tools. So thanks so much uh, to, uh, to Farah for joining us today. And if you have already participated in one of our web webinars, welcome back. For those of you who are new to this series, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things on to Farah. So very quickly, a Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit based in Montreal that works to empower girls. And uh, in Montreal, we have um, so we run some local girls programs, but we also work with some 300 members and partners across the country who run um, girls programs in their communities, as well as who advocate uh, for girls and young women. Um, some of our activities include leadership training, networking events, and projects that bring together girls and young women. Um, in terms of impact, nationally, we reach around 60,000 girls, uh, girls and young women, and uh, the population is located in, in remote areas, marginalized in urban communities, and some also located in the north. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the Sparks Talks uh, webinar series that is being presented today, and it was created during the Light a Spark Awareness Campaign, uh, whose goal was to showcase women role models across the country. And during that campaign, more than 60 women participated by doing things like writing blogs and presenting webinars. Um, and we are very happy to continue the Sparks Talk series and give you the opportunity to continue to connect with inspiring women, such as uh, Farah, who you'll hear from in um, just one more moment. Um, before passing things on, I do want to take a couple of minutes to just orient everyone to um, the webinar platform. So you should be seeing on your screens uh, a series of uh, information displays and slides, and those will be changing uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, you should also see a series of panels on the right-hand side of your screen, and one of those panels is called the Q&A box, and this is where you can ask questions and um, interact. With, uh, with Farah as, as well as myself. Um, and I, I will be moderating today's Q&A session. So please select my name from the drop-down menu um, in order to, to ask a question. And when the Q&A session begins, I will pass those on to, to Farah. You can also ask me questions if you're having some, some tech issues. Um, someone is, is uh, writing, for example, that they're hearing a quiet echo. It's really important to, to make sure that um, your speakers are turned on or if you're using a headset that you've adjusted the volume controls. Um, a, a lot of these things will depend on uh, the individual setup on your computer, um, but I will try to troubleshoot um, as much as I can from, from this end of things, but please uh, try to do um, all the troubleshooting you, you can um, on your end first. Um, I also want to point out that today's session is being recorded, and uh, I will send everyone a link to, to the recording in the new year, so you can have um, a record of, um, of what goes on today. So. Um, it is my pleasure to, to now introduce you to, to uh, Farah uh, Mawani. And Farah is a visiting scholar at Massey College in Toronto. She has a global she has global teaching, research, and policy experience in health, mental health, and community-based research. She has national experience as a senior policy and research analyst and mental health excuse me, strategist. Uh, Farah has worked with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, Multicultural Mental Health Resource Centre, the Centre for the Study of Gender, Social Inequities and Mental Health, among many other organizations. And Farah has recently founded Far Away Global, I love the name by the way, um, a nonprofit organization that mobilizes the public on global human rights and mental health. And the organization builds on Farah's, Farah's experience co-founding and directing the social media and global mobilization efforts of the campaign to free the hikers. The campaign led to the freedom of Josh, Josh Fatal, Shane Bauer, and Sarah Shord, who were held hostage in Iran for two years and two months. It's now my great pleasure to pass things over to, to Farah and to welcome you to uh, today's um, webinar 
series, and uh, just before doing so, I also wanted to, to let um, everyone know that I will be opening a poll, uh, some polling questions, and that will give uh, for an opportunity to, to see who's in the virtual room. So when you see the questions pop, on, pop up on your screen, please take a few moments moments to um, to answer them. And when everyone has answered the questions, then I will close the polls, as they say, and um, and you'll all be able to, to see the results. So you should be seeing questions appear on your screen right now. And uh, Farah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elvira. And uh, I echo Elvira's welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, uh, I'm honored uh, that you're interested in um, hearing my experience and learning from it, and I, uh, I hope for some uh, rich exchange. Um, so, you know, I, I want to start by just saying uh, I have no choice but to start at the beginning of my social media story. Um, this presentation is very different from academic ones I give because it's um, grounded in my personal experience uh, and my intense traumatic personal experience. So uh, I may get emotional um, as I present, uh, but I hope that you find ways to translate my experience into your work. Uh, and please do ask questions to maximize the usefulness of my presentation to you. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of our, our poll questions, but I, I, I do already have a sense that um, you're a very diverse audience in terms of um, geography, organization, uh, role within your organization. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to do my best to, uh, you know, give a broad, broadly re relevant presentation, but I, I certainly welcome uh, your questions. Um, so to start that story, in uh, July 2009, I was an academic completing my PhD in public health sciences, uh, and I'd, I had just finished teaching global health on an American undergraduate study abroad program uh, when my closest friend and colleague on that program, Josh Fatal, was captured and taken hostage by the Iranian regime, along with his friends Shane Bauer and Sarah Shord. I was shocked, terrified, and convinced that I was having a nightmare that I would wake from any moment. But somehow in that oppressive fog, I knew that I had to take action. Uh, quote, to keep Josh safe, unquote, is the way I worded it in my first Facebook message to Josh's brother, which was just uh, the day that I, I found out what had happened. Um, we never knew what uh, nor how long uh, that would take, but we knew we had to do everything we could think of and more. Uh, there is nothing more motivating than saving the life of a loved one. So within days of their capture, when we didn't know where they were or what had happened to them, uh, we started to build a website uh, that, along with media, diplomacy, social media, and global events, uh, grew into our Free the Hikers campaign. Uh, and that was the campaign, as Elvira mentioned, that freed Josh, Shane, and Sarah after two years and two months. Beyond our success at achieving our seemingly impossible ultimate goal of freeing them, we succeeded at building a campaign that continuously grew in supporter numbers uh, in global reach and in levels of engagement. Uh, and just to give you an idea of uh, what that looked like um, in social media terms, uh, when Shane and Josh were freed, uh, our campaign Facebook page included 31,000 supporters, and uh, the number of YouTube views on our most popular campaign video, uh, which was one featuring uh, Sarah after she was freed, uh, reached 364,000. And for me, one of our greatest indicators of success uh, was that at numerous points in the campaign, uh, supporters took their own initiative to act, organize, and fundraise. Uh, for example, when, when Sarah was freed um, after 400 and... Uh, 10 days, um, sorry, I'm yeah, just going to... go back to your presentation. <laughs> oh, okay, how did... Uh, yeah. Just click um, on, those, on the... Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, 
it, can everyone see uh, my presentation at the moment? We're good. Okay. Uh, sorry about that glitch. Um, so yeah, that just is a brief uh, agenda of what I'm going to cover, um, and I'm in the where it all began part. But uh, here is part of a, a timeline of the campaign, um, just to give you a context for for this story. Um, and you can see there, you know, when Sarah was released, um, September 14th, 2010, after 410 days in solitary confinement. Uh, the media reported that the Iranian regime was uh, demanding uh, $500,000 bail for her release. Um, and we were instructed not to discuss that bail money in any of our communication, whether on media or social media. Um, and, uh, you know, as the person kind of directing social media, uh, that was emphasized to me in terms of my communication on social media. Um, but supporters, of course, flooded our, our social media accounts with questions about the bail. You know, who is paying the bail? Do the families have to raise the money? Can we help? And given the culture I had fostered of responding directly to, to supporter questions, um, it was very difficult not to respond at all, but, but I actually didn't even have an, any answers myself. Um, and I watched, uh, as before my very eyes, supporters, um, you know, in the face of getting no responses to their questions, organize themselves to raise funds. Uh, it started with, you know, one person posting and saying, hey, uh, you know, there's 25,000 of us on this Facebook page. If each of us donate just $25, we can get her out of there. And, um, you know, then somebody else would post, um, yes, I'm doing that. Uh, and somebody else would post, you know, yes, I just did that. And here's the link for you to do the same. And it just... Um, snowballed from there uh, to the point we even had people um, asking if everyone could donate a hundred dollars because then maybe we could get all three of them out and you know this was without us saying anything about you know um, where the money was coming from whether uh, donating to the campaign would go towards the bail um, and and, you know, I think that was a really, really powerful indication of, of how engaged people were. And three, three key strategies that enabled us to achieve this level of engagement were, one, to make the issue matter to people around the world, uh, two, to create community around the issue, and three, to maximize the impact of our campaign. And, uh, you know, I'll discuss these strategies, uh, giving examples um, primarily from our Rich Free the Hikers experience, um, but also from some other work I've been involved in since. Um, and so, again, this is just the, before I continue, just um, the second part of the timeline, uh, just to show you that it was... Uh, kind of a, a complex, long story with with numerous ups and downs and, and this timeline just uh you know highlights some of some of the key key ones, but there were many uh periods where we actually had trials scheduled and cancelled at the very last minute. Uh we had a, a point after the final trial session where, where Shane and Josh were sentenced to eight years in prison in Iran. Um and you know just about a month later uh they were freed. Um so in terms of making it matter, um and you know how you know you might be asking how exactly do you do that? Um, you know, from what I learned from the campaign, um, I think a really big part of that was was the fact that we started from our personal experience. You know, then we shared that experience, um, and that led to to local and global action. So, you know. When you're sharing your personal experience, I mean, obviously ours was a was a unique case, but but I think, you know, you can translate it to to many many other um, campaigns issues. Um, you know, focusing on sharing why you are passionate about your cause, campaign, organization. Um, you know, sharing that personal experience um, and connection to engage others to care about your cause, campaign 
maintain our organization. Um, and, and, you know, I, in terms of concretely, there may be, you may have um, sort of formal organizational social media accounts and, you know, may have to have a more formal um, voice from those accounts, but um, there are still ways for you to have, you know, personal accounts um, that uh, direct people to that those formal accounts, but but share more of a personal perspective of yours. And in in the case of Free the Hikers, um, one of the hardest things for me to do was to share my personal experience of of the loss of Josh uh, and of my fear for him. Um, this photo was taken at a vigil in New York City to mark two months of a captivity. Uh, I was nervous enough about standing in front of a crowd of strangers in Washington Square Park, but the thought of sharing you know, my personal experience was daunting, to say the least. Um, but I knew that it was a critical part of getting people to understand the depth of the injustice against him. Uh, I knew that they needed to gain that understanding to feel compelled to act. Um, and those of us close to Sh Josh, Shane, and Sarah knew that at a time when they were silenced, we needed to be their voices and share who they were with the world. Uh, so we did so in every way we could think of, uh, photos, texts, testimonials on our website, posts uh, from family and friends on our community blog um, uh, that grew into posts from supporters. Uh, that told more personal perspectives, uh, videos on YouTube, podcasts on Audioboo, um, events based in, in their communities initially and then communities around the world. Um, and we saw the results continue to grow. Uh, people went from taking small actions, such as liking our Facebook page, uh, following our Twitter account, to signing our online petition. Um, and you know, initially, those even those small actions um, it would only uh, occur after frequent pleas from us. Um, but but people went from from there to taking initiative themselves to act in much bigger ways, such as organizing events. Um, and organizing fundraising, uh, as the example I gave earlier illustrates. And this is a very small uh, sampling of, of the types of messages that we received on our Facebook page that express the extent of engagement of supporters. Every time I see an update, I'm hoping it is the one that alerts us that they are on a plane back to the U.S. Long road. Can't wait for their freedom. Every morning when I wake up, I look to see if there's any news. I'm waiting with you and hoping they will be free soon. No need for thanks. We're all in this together. More people should be helping. It's just the right thing to do. And these are all people who, who didn't know Sarah, Shane, and Josh. Um, and, and, you know, as their comments uh, indicate, uh, we... We tended to post on our Facebook page every half an hour um, during a day. And if we didn't, uh, for any reason, if there was a, a pause in our, our communication on that page, uh, you know, people would reach out to us and say, hey, what, what's the latest news? I keep checking and I, I don't see anything. So to kind of maintain that level of engagement for a, a greater than two-year period, I think, was, was quite um, an achievement. Um, now I'm going to go to another example. Um, a few months after Josh and Shane were released, I was asked by the International Center for Human Rights in Iran to speak out for Saeed Malikpour, uh, a Canadian permanent resident sentenced to death in Iran. I spoke outside the Iranian embassy in Ottawa uh, from my personal perspective as co-founder of the Free the Hikers campaign. Um, I mean, I, I had been in the public eye specifically around uh, unjust imprisonment in Iran, um, but I also, of course, you know, understood the experience from from a personal uh, perspective. Uh, so, you know, the statement uh, I read out, um, oh, just an excerpt. Uh, from it was, um, I have never appreciated my freedom more than during that nightmare, and I live by Nelson Mandela's wise words, 
for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chain, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. So I support the campaign to free Saeed and urge you to do the same and speak out loud and clear against his imminent execution. Like Josh, Shane, and Sarah, he needs us to be the voice that is being stolen from him. He needs us to fight for the human rights he is being denied. He needs us to fight for his life, the life that will be taken from him if we are silent. And I, I shared that um, action on my website, Facebook, and Twitter accounts, um, and, and was able to gain new supporters for Saeed's campaign uh, you know, from our large uh, support base. Um, and another example, a few days after Josh and Shane were freed, um, the campaign team for Jason Purasal, an American held in Nicaragua, appealed to me for help uh, in their effort to understand why they had not yet reached 1,500 Facebook supporters uh, when he had been in prison for a year and a half while we had reached 31,000 supporters after two years and two months. They stated... He's different from Sarah, Shane, and Josh. There's nothing for people to grab onto and become engaged. Um, they didn't understand that it was their role to give people something to grab onto, and perhaps we had done our job so well that they didn't even realize how much work we had put into making people care about Josh, Shane, and Sarah, making them feel like they were their sons, brothers, sister, daughter, friends, colleagues. Um, I spent some time contributing to Jason's campaign, uh, again, starting from my personal experience. Um, on International Women's Day, I highlighted the strength, courage, and determination of Jason's sister as she led the fight for Jason's freedom. On Mother's Day, I wrote a blog post about mothers of the wrongfully imprisoned, uh, featuring my experience with the mothers of Sarah, Shane, and Josh, uh, and a message from directly from Jason's mother. Uh, and her words were, um, the impact of her words uh, was magnified, uh, both because of the timing, um, being Mother's Day, but, but also because she had not spoken out uh, very much. Um, and, uh, you know, she spoke directly about the impact of, of not having Jason with her on Mother's Day. Um, and another example, um, a, a week after Josh and Shane were released, I started volunteering with the Self-Help Resource Center, um, a registered charity uh, whose mission is to strengthen communities across Ontario by promoting and building the capacity of peer support groups. As many of you know, uh, peer support groups uh, facilitate positive outcomes for people facing diverse life transitions and challenges to their physical, mental, and or social health. Um, I posted on Facebook about my involvement, um, uh, highlighting the importance of peer support to my surviving the Free the Hikers ordeal. Um, and campaign supporters, um, Free the Hikers campaign supporters from the UK to the US responded by liking and sharing my posts. Um, one posting on her page, every city should have a resource center like this. Please check this out. It's called the Self-Help Resource Center based in Toronto, Ontario. And in my uh, communication with her, expressing appreciation for her sharing that um, so um, so kind of profoundly, uh, she she donated uh, five hundred dollars to the organization, and and she's not even based in Canada um, when our our catchment is Ontario. So um, that was uh, really really moving. Um, and I'm now working on outreach and training for the Self-Help Resource Center. Um, we have just hired, uh, you know, some of you may be particularly interested in this if your uh, programming focuses on, on girls. Um, we have just hired a youth outreach coordinator uh, for a youth initiative project funded by the City of Toronto's Investing in Neighborhood grant. Um, we'll be reaching out to youth organizations around the greater Toronto area, offering 
during youth-focused training on how to start and maintain peer groups, um, peer support groups. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to working with our youth outreach coordinator to integrate uh, social media into our outreach and engagement approach um, and, uh, you know, hope for some opportunities in the future to, um, to connect with you about that and, and perhaps share some of those uh, experiences. Um, so I'm going to move I on to, to oh, sorry, uh, yeah, before I get to the next uh, I just wanted to let you know that the polling results are in, so if oh, okay. you Great. Me to have a look at them and um, feel free to, to, to comment, them, comment on them. Um, they're on the right-hand side. You should see them on the, uh, as an option in one of your panels on the right-hand side. Um, the polling panel, if you open that up, you'll see the responses. And uh, just to let you know that uh, most of the people um, in the in the virtual room work um, in a nonprofit organization, and some some work with girls and young women, um, and um, almost an equal number work in the human rights field. Some work in the mental health field. Most uh, work primarily on a local level and then uh, national comes next, and some international. And I'll let you, um, did you, did you find the panel? Did you, um, I, I see the panel, but I only see the questions. I don't see any results okay. on my screen. Okay, so, so, um, so I guess it's, uh, it's me that will share the results. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and um, in terms of mobilizing uh, people who are primarily focused on mobilizing the general public, it's almost an equal number with uh, the number who are uh, focused on mobilizing uh, in their particular community. And uh, a fewer number are working to mobilize politicians or policymakers. So in other words, most are working on a grassroots level. And in terms of social media plan, um, actually most who responded said they don't have one social media strategy or plan, but some do. And of those who have one, um, most of the people on um, the call are responsible for it, and about 30% um, are not. So that gives you a sense of, of who's in the room. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> and yeah, thank also you. wanted to, to, to give a shout out to, to people to um, just remind you that you can s send in your questions at any moment. Um, and so I'm uh, attentively paying attention to the Q&A box. Feel free to, to send me your questions. That will pass on to, to Sarah in a few minutes. So thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, that's, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so yes, as Elvira said, please do feel free to, to ask um, questions uh, to make this as helpful to you as possible. Um, so I'm going to jump to you know my next um, recommended uh, strategy, um, and that's uh, you know, create community. Um, you know, that is obviously not an easy thing to do, but um, I think there's you know many ways um, that you can work on that, and, and I'm sure many of you, you know, already do that in ver in many ways in your work. Um, but in terms of uh, my experiences, uh, particularly with with Free the Hikers. Um, uh, you know, knowing your audience and, and building that audience are, are really, really key um, components of, of creating community. Um, you know, starting with those you know will support you and working from there. Uh, so in the case of Free the Hikers, um, you know, we started with family and friends uh, close to Sarah, Shane, and Josh. Um, and, and though that sort of core group um, I mean, it took it took a fair amount of work and time uh, to connect uh, and and build that community because there were, of course, three of them, um, and you know their families were were spread all over the country and the world, and uh, and their friends were were even more spread out. Um, and without them present, of course, you know we had to do quite a bit of work to to build um, build that community and just to find people, uh, find out who <laughs> were members of their community. But um, uh, but I think you know that was uh, really really key um, 
part of our campaign because you know that core group then reached out to their family and friends and compelled them to to be engaged um, you know because of their personal connections um, and then you know that group reached out to their family and friends etc until until the growth of the campaign gained a momentum of its own but those initial core connections uh, really played a key role in keeping the momentum of, of campaign growth going throughout the entire campaign. Um, and you know, with the, another example with the Self-Help Resource Center, um, really I've found that uh, having staff, board members, um, people participating in peer support uh, share their personal experiences about the difference that peer support makes to their lives has the most powerful impact on engaging uh, supporters and, and future program participants and, and peer support participants. Um, so uh, another thing, you know, uh, that's quite connected to building your audience is, is diversifying your audience. Um, you know, with Free the Hikers, we had an incredibly diverse range of supporters across many, many dimensions of diversity, uh, age, nationality, political purposes, um, and, and we were constantly, uh, you know, looking beyond the groups that we had engaged um, to to make specific efforts to engage more. Uh, and we even built a very large, very engaged support base among Iranians around the world, uh, including in Iran. And, and that um, you know, was, of, of course, something that required a lot of, of sensitivity and, and work. Um, but again, I think was, was really, really key to our success. Um, so thinking about you know, what uh, could be key to, to your success and, and going beyond what you even think is possible, uh, I think is really, really important. Um, and we, you know, we also, uh, to highlight the age piece because of, you know, those of you working with girls and young women in particular, um, you know, we had many uh, young children uh, and youth involved in the campaign in very concrete ways. Uh, you know, it started with, with children and youth who had some connection to family and friends of Sarah, Shane, and Josh, but, but it, it went beyond that fairly quickly. Um, you know, there's, there's a great example of that that I, um, you know, will give uh, later on in the presentation, um, uh, but I just wanted to mention that now. Um, so in addition to this really diverse global public that we engaged, um, we also engaged the support of numerous global leaders and high-profile public figures, uh, including Secretary General of the United Nations Ban Ki-moon, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Noam Chomsky, Cornell West, uh, and many, many more. Um, we worked together um, I worked very closely with family members of Josh, Shane, and Sarah to obtain statements from uh, global mental health, social justice, and environmental leaders calling for their release. Um, global politicians, um, including President Obama, Secretary of State Clinton, politicians from Canada, Switzerland, Brazil, Turkey, Oman, and others also made public statements calling for their release. Um, but you know, all of all of that required a lot of work on our part to engage them, and in many many cases, uh, that involved um, you know finding a way to connect with them you know beyond sort of just the the obvious um, injustice. So uh, with Desmond Tutu, for example, um, I had spent a month with jo Josh in South Africa, you know, working with him there. So I wrote a letter to him um, outlining what um, what Josh had done in South Africa, highlighting the work he had done that, that was in line with, with uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's priorities. Um, and so that played a role. Um, and uh, we also partnered with and received support from international human rights organizations, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Witness, uh, and Safe World for Women, uh, along with other um, key women's organizations um, when we focused on, on Sarah's uh, situation in particular. And, and she was, you know, being... 
uh, treated much more harshly. Uh, the, the, all three of them had been in solitary, were held in solitary confinement for four months, and then she um, was left in solitary confinement uh, for the duration of her captivity, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was 410 days. Um, and one of the most amazing phenomena we experienced um, in terms of high-profile uh, support was, was Oprah power. Um, Oprah interviewed Sarah uh, and the three mothers um, days after Sarah's release, uh, and she broadcast and shared our website on hers, um, leading to our website crashing promptly. Um, and I watched as our Facebook and Twitter supporters spiked um, every time that episode episode was shown in another country, um, which, you know, ha continues to happen still um, more than, uh, you know, more than a year, uh, a couple of years later. Um, every time uh, we would get a spike of supporters from the country where the episode was shown. Um, and so another couple of um, you know, key uh, key tips are around communicating, you know, directly to supporters um, personally, uh, you know, as well as um, in various uh, group uh, sort of forms, um, and to communicate uh, peacefully. Um, I mean, despite the fact that we had, you know, so many thousands of supporters around the world, um, you know, with the help of some very dedicated volunteers, um, you know, we really prioritized being as individually responsive to every comment and uh, question as, as we could be. Um, and, and people frequently expressed surprise at our ability to do that, um, you know, given the amount we were dealing with and, and the amount of people, uh, you know, we were organizing. Um, but, but I do think that was a very, very key part of, of the extent to which people were engaged. Um, and, and communicating peacefully, I think, was another another big, big part of our success. Um, we were committed to integrity throughout our campaign, no matter what lack of integrity we were faced with. And uh, you know, I think some of the advice uh, that I, I have, uh, based on our experience, is um, you know articulate your values clearly and, and stay true to them in every word and action of yours. Um, choose who you work and partner with based on those values because, you know, those um, partners uh, communicate something about uh, who you are. Um, so I, I think that's very, very key. Um, and another concrete suggestion that worked very well for us was, um, you know, develop and post communication guidelines based on your values. Uh, and and you know, guidelines that are um, directed to all members of your online communities, uh, including staff, volunteers, um, and supporters. Um, you know, follow those guidelines in, in every communication of yours and enforce those guidelines on your social media spaces. Um, you know, for us, a peaceful resolution on humanitarian grounds was key. Um, so, you know, we communicated peacefully no matter how people, including Iranian regime agents, uh, communicated with us. And we demanded the same of our supporters. Um, we even enforced those guidelines in communication between supporters on our social media spaces. And, and I think that was a very, very key part of our ability to build um, support among the global Iranian community. Um, and, and, you know, these guidelines allow, uh, such guidelines allow you to be proactive in building the kind of communication and support that you want, uh, rather than having to react to negativity or unexpected crises. Um, you know, there may still be some of those, but, uh, but you can definitely minimize those and, and even when they arise to, uh, sort of have, um, had a pre-thought out, uh, plan for responding. Um, and so, again, just to highlight, you know, we were able to build a peaceful, engaged community across great differences in, in politics, age, nationality, ethnicity, uh, et cetera, um, in the midst of the biggest crisis of all of our lives. 
uh, and many supporters continue to tell me that they supported us for our integrity as well as our mission. Um, and you know, there's some really, really moving examples of that in, in people's communication with us. But I'm uh, aware of time, so I'm going to try to just move on to make sure I can cover everything. Um, another thing in terms of ex uh, communicating directly to people, I mean, expressing appreciation individually uh, and in public messages posted on your social media accounts. Uh, and, you know, when I talk of expressing appreciation, I, I um, mean not just from organization staff and volunteers, um, but also from um, those whose supporters' actions are impacting, um, you know, whoever those may be for you. Um, so in our case, that was uh, expressing appreciation directly from families of Sarah, Shane, and Josh. Um, and, you know, that came naturally uh, to those of us who knew and loved Josh, Shane, and Sarah. I mean, every word uh, and action uh, that was supportive um, felt very personal to us. You know, we felt that people were helping to free our loved ones who meant the world to us. Um, but we, we always got uh, such amazing response uh, when we posted such messages or, or expressed that appreciation directly. Um, and, and kind of related to that, you know, make sure to tell people that they are making a difference, that every action they take contributes to your goal. Uh, in my experience, when, when people feel like one small action of theirs has made a difference, uh, they are likely to take more and bigger progressive actions. And we saw that over and over again uh, in our campaign. Um, and, you know, I think um, all of that certainly contributes to, to building momentum and building levels of engagement and, and building uh, community. And, and in terms of building community, think bef beyond your current objective or current campaign to, to longer term uh, relationships. Um, you know, I've maintained strong, positive relationships with, with many of our Free the Hiker supporters um, with whom I've only ever in interacted online. Um, you know, they have become supporters of my work with other campaigns and organizations. Um, and Farah, they, I'm just going to interject here to say yep. it's 12.43. Um, I want to give people okay. a chance to to ask some questions and uh, maybe hear a conversation. So I know you have a number of slides left. A couple of minutes more? Sure, sure. No problem. Yep. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, that is something I certainly want to to emphasize that, uh, you know, think beyond the immediate when you're, when you're building community. Um, and so, in terms of maximizing impact, uh, you know, I've already given many examples of this, but I, I really want to highlight the importance of integrating social media with media and community-based events. Um, and in doing that, you know, be creative, um, you know, which requires a combination of planning, but also openness to opportunities and ideas. Um, be clear, uh, you know, provide the clearest possible instructions you can um, for people to, to support your um, campaign or um, organization, uh, and provide tools, make it as easy as possible uh, for people to take action. Um, and just very quickly, um, I'm going to, uh, so, you know, our campaign certainly integrated uh, diplomacy, media, and our public campaign. Um, and we, you know, progressively increased our uh, events um, and the scope of our events as the campaign continued. So we went from having vigils in their three hometowns to vigils across the United States to vigils around the world. Uh, when we reached w one year of captivity, we had up to 40 events happening around the world uh, from everywhere, from you know Asia to South America to uh, Europe to North America. Um, so it was very, very powerful, um, and we really integrated it with uh, social media and media. 
Um, and then when Sarah was freed, of course, uh, you know, we had her at the forefront of, of action for the campaign. Um, and, you know, we continued up until two years. Um, we, we did also, uh, just a quick example, have YouTube um, uh, feature us on their home page uh, twice during the campaign at the 500 day mark and at the two year mark. Um, and that gave us, as you can see from how largely this was featured, um, it uh, gave us a lot of uh, support. Um, and then champions, I, uh, Muhammad Ali was one of our champions, and uh, this is a picture of, of, of Josh's brother Alex with him during the campaign. And I just wanted to show it as an illustration of, you know, champions have a high public profile, but they can also provide immense, you know, personal support. Uh, when Josh was interviewed at the one-year uh, mark of freedom uh, just a couple of months ago, um, he stated that uh, when he first heard um, that Muhammad Ali was supporting the campaign, he dropped the letter that uh, informed him of that and started shadow boxing in his cell. Um, and this, it's a little distorted, but is, uh, is a poster created by a group of kids aged 9 to 11 uh, spread across the U.S. that they came together and created this poster um, for the campaign and, and we, we used it um, as much as we could. So sort of getting contributions from people but really integrating them into what you do. Um, um, sorry, I'm and I'm wrapping up. For, 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 yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, to interrupt for a second because um, I think you've done a really great job at uh, already sort of presenting um, how uh, what you've done is a testament to connecting the personal um, and the political, you know, on a local and a global level and some people starting and um, asking questions. So I wanted to okay, give great. Yeah. Uh, a chance Let's just to, jump into the, those. To, to address some of the questions. So um, if uh, um, let me know if, uh, if you would prefer that I don't mention your name. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, the, the first person who, who asked a question, and it's uh, coming from Lisa. Um, I'm interested in your comment about um, how to communicate peacefully. You said to articulate your values and commit to integrity. How do you deal with people leaving comments that are negative or antagonistic? So That's a, a great, question. great question, um, and I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we of course we had very we had we had to deal with that quite extensively, and um, w one thing that we did that that was very effective was to directly refer people to our guidelines. So depending on how uh, negative or antagonistic something was. Um, you know, to to post in response to them, um, you know, this, you know, your comment goes against our guidelines, you know, refer here, refer to our guidelines, you know, um, highlight that, that uh, you know, what we need most is support um, and peaceful communication uh, to achieve our goal. Uh, we'd give people an opportunity to respond to that. Um, most often, people would respond, would apologize. Uh, they, you know, they may even change their perspective on the issue that they were, uh, you know, antagonistic about. Um, so, you know, I really think such guidelines are important. And then when people would continue to, despite us referring them to the guidelines and explaining the guidelines to them, um, you know, we, we would uh, block people from from the space um, if, when given a chance, they didn't um, change. So really be, being vigilant about um, the communications, your guidelines, and, and sticking to them and finding a, a gentle way of, of uh, interacting. Yeah, and, and in many cases, opinions. yeah, in many cases, people, you know, we I would start by saying, okay, you've liked our Facebook page, so you're a supporter. Thank you for your support. You know, I would start with thank you for your support, and and starting with that assumption, um, I assume you want to be supportive, and and this is what we need, um, and this is what Sarah, Shane, and Josh need, and then that would have a huge impact to, to the extent that it even had an impact on uh, some Iranian agents posting really negative things, so it's very powerful. 
Thank you for that. And uh, Julie asks, um, mm -hmm. je serais intéressée à savoir à quel point les campagnes deviennent trop pour les gens euh, qui sont sollicités des dons. Comment fait-on pour savoir si on sollicite trop les gens? So how do you know if you are asking too much of, uh, of people that support your campaign? Um, well, I think um, a couple of key, That's again, that's a very, very good question. Um, a couple of key key things we did. Uh, one was, you know, really get to know, as I said, you know, know your audience. So, so, you know, pay attention to their responses to your requests um, to get a sense of, you know, how people are responding. You know, what is possible for people, what is not possible for people. Um, there's usually quite a range. You know, there are, and and I think we just accepted that very early on. There there will be some people um, who will only like the Facebook page and they won't take further action. There will be some people who will only sign your petition and they won't take further action. Um, but but what we did was we expressed appreciation even for those things that might seem small um, and uh, and then you know encouraged people um, to take further action uh, but really just accepted that that people uh, you know would um, take the action that was workable for them, and we would communicate that that all of those actions combined were really uh, helping us to achieve our goal. Um, and uh, I think that was uh, that was very effective. People had many options of different levels of involvement, so they could do very small actions or get involved in bigger ways. I kind of want to follow up on that, as in, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the, the example you're giving, the free. Um, Free the Hikers campaign, your objective, your, your goal was super clear to free the hikers. And mm -hmm. so you know if you succeeded, if that happened. Um, mm -hmm. If your objective or your goal is to work on things like violence prevention or mental health, um, how do you set targets for those kind of sort of really long-term social change kind of goals and, and know that you're you know, the impact or get a sense of the kind of impact you're making. Um, if your your goals are slightly broader, <laughs> do you need to set very specific targets? I think, you know, again, that's a very good question. And, and although, um, you know, in our example, uh, there was a, a very specific goal, it still was a fairly lengthy campaign with, with many ups and downs where where we had to keep communicating that, people were making a difference even when we weren't achieving our ultimate goal, right? So so I think that's really key is to um, to highlight achievements that you are making. So it may be that, okay, you're, um, you know, you're growing your support uh, in numbers, you're growing your support in breadth in, in, in terms of, you know, how, if it's a national campaign, you know, how much are you getting support from different parts of the country? Um, you know, do you have um, concrete objectives within your overall goal? Um, however small they might seem, you know, making sure to celebrate your achievements along the way. I mean, in our case, we would get the most response when we shared something positive, and it could be that, um, you know, okay, uh, they're not in solitary confinement anymore, okay, they were able to make one two-minute phone call home. Um, whatever, you know, the achievement was to make sure to communicate about it and celebrate it and communicate to people that they played a part in that achievement. Um, so I think that can translate to, to other broader issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, before passing on to the next question or to, mm -hmm. um, to, to reading the next question, I just want to um, let participants know that we're getting close to 1 p.m. And um, now that we're getting into the conversation, I wanted to, uh, to welcome you to stay on a little bit past 1 p.m. So uh, for those of you whose lunch break, if you are on lunch break, doesn't end at 1, um, we'll probably end at around 1.05 or so, so hopefully you can stay on for, for another um, 10 minutes or so. Um, so Casey asks, um, how do you integrate local
local events into the overall campaign. Um, what were the outcomes of local events on the global initiative? And I think um, Casey uh, works uh, for CSI, Centre for Social Innovation in Toronto. Okay. Um, yeah, again, a great question. Um, we, you know, I think uh, local events were very, very key, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, we started with events in their in their hometowns, um, and and grew from there to events in uh, locations where they had uh, family uh, and friends to take the lead, um, and you know, I think those were really key in terms of. Um, people getting to actually meet people who had a connection to them, it, it made it, I think, a lot more real to them. Um, we, we always had um, sort of media coverage of local events. We, we had um, um, some really amazing uh, PR uh, people advising us um, and, and giving us sort of broad tools that we could um, you know, use uh, to approach media, um, and then you know to uh, modify to to make you know relevant locally, um, and then we really promoted um, you know ahead of time if if there was an event in in a particular place, we created you know a Facebook event listing. Um, on our Facebook page, we promoted it there. Um, we shared, uh, you know, photos, videos of the event, any media coverage of, of the event, um, and we tried to do it as promptly as possible, you know, live when possible, um, and uh, you know that. So that also had an impact on people who weren't attending the events but were supporting us online. It gave them this feeling that there was momentum um, and, and we really worked at continuing to grow that. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. So keeping people, keeping people connected and, and updated um, on a regular basis is uh, super important. I, I'm hearing from you, and um, and you know, you, I wanted to also follow up. And uh, you, you talked about you just mentioned PR. You had people giving you PR advice, and during your presentation, you you talked about some really high profile um, people, uh, human rights activists, and and human rights organizations, and 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 also media outlets such as the the Oprah Machine, <laughs> that we call yeah. it. So I mean, uh, I'm sure you have lots of great stories and how all of that. Came came about for people working, again, in really uh, local communities, grassroots communities, perhaps mm -hmm. in remote areas, who may not have that access um, to even the resources to even begin to think about how to garner that kind of high-profile support. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how, how can we engage uh, the public or the people that we're trying to engage um, within uh, perhaps more modest means? Mm -hmm. or within the uh, within the set of constraints um well i guess uh, you know a couple of things i would say to that one is you know i don't want to give the impression that we were extremely highly resourced i mean ours was very much a grassroots campaign um that you know had no funding other than than uh people's donations and um you know we were very fortunate the PR people i mentioned you know offered their time pro bono um and that was uh, especially fortunate for us given how long the campaign was um you know that they they stayed with us um so i think um you know certainly not not feeling limited, um, you know, thinking beyond uh, what you, um, you know, think you can achieve. I mean, we uh, we put in a lot of work to to engage um, all these people, and and some of you know one example I'll give you is is we put in a lot of time and energy trying to capture the interest of media for for a long uh, part of the campaign, uh, but uh, the CNN reporter who, I mean, of course, it became a global story, and um, so there there was, uh, you know, sort of 
media attention uh, after a certain point without us making the effort. But um, but the CNN reporter who interviewed Josh at the One Year Freedom Mark um, was a reporter that I built a relationship with over Twitter, um, and you know it became. A, a, a personal kind of relationship to the extent of, you know, he would share breaking news with me before I got it from any other source. Like um, a lot of, we had a lot of media people who, who did, you know, get to care about the issue, but particularly through their personal connections with those of us close to Sarah, Shane, and Josh. So, so I go back to that uh, recommendation to kind of start from the personal and engage um, with the people in your context who can be helpful to you, but to also, you know, reach beyond what um, connections you, you think you can achieve. Well, thank you for, for clarifying that. And um, what I'm really hearing is that it's it's a lot to do with the mindset that, that you hold or that you mm-hmm. went, went uh, that you started. Um the mindset that you had when you when uh, you started all of this, and that really struck me um, in your your presentation. As a lot of people might uh, see daily news reports, um, traditional media or social media, and are affected by the uh, the issues that that they they hear about. But most, I would say, most people, the average person, aren't necessarily propelled to take action, perhaps because they think the issue is too big and how could they make a difference and, you know, how could one person make a difference? So I was wondering if you could share, um, if from the start, like, did you feel that you could make a difference or was this something you just felt you had to do and that that feeling of uh, being able to, to have an impact on such a scale sort of grew over time? Um, sorry, uh, how, uh, can you just repeat the last part? How did just there... In, in sense of, you know, how did you motivate, really, mm-hmm. yourself to, to keep going for two years? And yeah. from the start, did you have a vision? Uh, or were you just compelled to act because this, is, this affected you personally and you felt you had to do something and over time you felt, yes, I, I am making a difference, I can make a difference? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, initially, uh, I mean, we were really in crisis mode. Uh, we had no idea how long this was going to take from day to day, and we honestly never, ever knew how long it would take until the day they were freed. Um, so, you know, at the beginning, I mean, we were still thinking in terms of uh, let's get them out of there within a few days, you know, and then it became, okay, can we do it in a couple of weeks now? And and so, um you know that I think until we hit the one year mark, um, we weren't even thinking in terms of oh we should have a long term plan um, uh, because we were just day to day kind of uh, responding to a crisis. Uh, but one thing that we did do very very early on, which uh, I, I think was key to our success, was was we we did have a sense that okay. Um, you know, if we uh, we're going to focus on these actions now, um, and if they're uh, and they may be freed within a couple of weeks. If they're not free within a couple of weeks, then we move to Plan B. Um, we were always kind of thinking ahead of uh, what we would work on next um, if they weren't freed. Um, and uh, we're able to start putting things in place for that uh, those next steps as we waited to find out what the results of our kind of current actions were. Um, and you know, I think for me, because uh, you know Josh was such a close close friend, um, I never ever doubted that I was doing what I had to do. Um, but in my any of my low points, um, certainly the the core group of people that I was working with um, were, um, you know, they really really boosted my spirits at critical times. I mean, including their family members. Um, we were really really key supporters to each other, and then and then broader supporters were were really amazing. I mean. There were times I would post something on Twitter just that, 
indicated that I was struggling and I would get responses from all over the world, very compassionate, very helpful responses. Um, so that was another layer of, of the impact of social media for us personally. Well, thank you for sharing that. So the community of support is super important and certainly important uh, to the values of the Girls Action Foundation. And I, I have so many follow-up questions that uh, that I could ask. There, there are people um, that would love to uh, to know if you uh, are willing to share the guidelines. You talked about communication guidelines um, earlier on, and some people mm -hmm. would like to know if they could um, send questions to you by email. So maybe I will uh, throw the floor back to you to perhaps answer those last two questions and uh, to wrap up. Um, if you wanted to spend the next, last couple minutes just wrapping up your presentation, and um, and then I'll say a couple more words, but um, or just end the today's webinar and um, and look forward to to continuing the conversation with you, Farah. Thank you so much, and and thank you to everybody for um, participating, listening, and and uh, asking some really really great questions. Um, I would be more than happy to hear from you by email. I'm, I've put up the slide that gives you my contact information. Uh, so please, you know, do take note and, and feel free to, to get in touch with me. Um, I uh, I can share um, uh, some of the guideline or the guidelines that we we posted. Um, and I'd be happy to, I, I did notice a question specifically asking about tips for uh, developing a social media strategy and, and plan. I'd be happy to, to hear from you by email and, and, and follow up um, with you there. Uh, so yes, anything that uh, I haven't covered, please do get in touch. All right, great. And I think it would be perhaps appropriate to uh, to read out the, um, a comment from a um, participant earlier. I also wanted to say that I watched the hiker situation unfold every day and was profoundly hurt when they received eight years. I had the privilege of meeting Josh, Shane, and Sarah, and it was one of the most moving experiences of my life. Now wow. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> and Thank so you for sharing that. that. So I wanted to, to share that, and again, thank everyone uh, for participating in today's session and to remind you that, um, in fact, um, the, this is being recorded and will be made available and uh, set to you in the new year. And I just wanted to actually, maybe if I could ask uh, Farah for you to do that, uh, go back to the Girls Action uh, presentation. I seem to have lost my, <laughs> my okay. control as the presenter. Um, mm -hmm. And just move this slide down um, so I could um, share with, with people that if they wanted more information about Girls Action, and, and in case you're, you're new um, oh, you uh, to the foundation, to please um, check out our, uh, our website, girlsactionfoundation.ca, and there you can find out more, lots of information, including more information about uh, more upcoming webinars, and feel free to like our Facebook page and our Twitter page, and um, yeah, just also feel free to contact me if if you have um, any questions about today's session or um, any upcoming webinars that you'd like more information about. So thank you again um, to all of the participants, and thank you so much for sharing your story for us and for, for inspiring all of us. Thank you very much to you and everyone else. Have a great day, everyone. And happy holidays. Yes, happy holidays. <laughs>